Welcome to Values, Virtues, Ethics and Morality. I am Magla Pillay and it is my pleasure to have in the studio with me Sister Denise, who has been with Brahma Kumaris for over 40 years practicing Raj Yoga meditation. Today's topic is morality and shame. And the purpose of this show is to introduce people to the idea of taking a deeper look at themselves so that they could re-examine their own conscience, look at their moral compass, re-evaluate their own ethical standards and ask themselves the simple question, is the way you're functioning working for you? We find in most situations people do wish to do the right thing, however, they still find themselves in a position of acting against their conscience. As you can see from the Grecian theme at the back, the format of today's show is called Socratic Dialogue, which means putting a series of questions to somebody in order to elicit a, a universal truth. So, Sister Denise, thank you very much for joining us today. And as usual, it's wonderful to have you with us in the studio. Thank you. Thank you. So tell us, um, morality and shame. It's uh, very linked, isn't it? Well, it is. It is. And it's also linked with the idea of prejudice, because to shame a person, uh, how you do that is by telling them something that you hold to be true, but which isn't necessarily true. For example, in a culture where in school people should be interested in science and um, preparing themselves for business, if that uh, school student is artistic and the moral um, authority people think that being artistic is bad, is sissy, then they will shame that person by telling them, look, normal people are not sissy, normal people don't like the arts, there's something wrong with you because you like beauty, you should be more interested in being aggressive, making money, making your mark, and they will shame that person and um, actually they will be sort of unable to pursue their um, their career of choice because of that shaming and they'll be forced to do something that they're not good at and then they'll be shamed for that because how come you're not good at this there's something wrong with you do you see what I mean so uh, yes, the, I do. Um, the morality is not determined by criteria that are spiritually valid, let's put it that way, but it's determined by criteria that assume um, an attitude of conquest, an attitude of aggression, an attitude of taking over everything and everyone, and um, asserting your um, superiority over, and anyone who doesn't want to be part of that, there's something wrong with them. The other uh, group of people who get shamed a lot is women and they will say, well, if you're um, very attractive, then you're a prostitute, uh, even if she's very young, you see. Um, if a man is attracted by a woman because she's beautiful, and then he will very often shame her for that um, to make her the cause of his disturbances inside. And this is also very much connected with pedophilia. We talked earlier a little bit about uh, the problem of pedophilia. And, and it's all linked to people trying to blame other people for causing their character defects 
and an unwillingness to say that, no, I have a character defect and the other person who is triggering my negative behavior is absolutely innocent. They wouldn't do that. They will shame that person uh, because they cannot bear to be what they are in terms of their uh, character defects. So shaming is a very good way to avoid taking responsible, uh, responsibility, but at the same time is extremely damaging to the person, you know. Mm. Um, I noticed that in certain cultures, if a woman happened to be a victim of a crime, she's meant to feel ashamed because she was a victim. What's up with that? Well, it's again part of the prejudice against women, you know. Um, women are supposed to be something which is not human. Um, and then if she is raped, for example, well, you asked for it. You see, and then if you look at the actual circumstances, that person is not doing any different from anybody else. But you see, um, it's an unwillingness to take responsibility for the activities of those who are like you, you see, because you could be one of them. But if the uh, other person is a victim, and you say that, well, it's your fault, or you deserve it, or whatever, then it exonerates the group to which that person belongs. Um, there are individuals who carry with them a deep sense of shame, um, due to the reasons that you just articulated, but also um, childhood neglect, childhood trauma being dumped by a partner, and or some religious-based uh, shame. How does one um, recover from that? How do you come back from that? And could you take us through the steps of um, uh, removing the feelings of shame from within? The feeling of shame begins at a very young age where the child is absolutely vulnerable and takes in as if the adult moral authority is telling the truth. The child considers these adult moral authorities to be not less than God, you know. And so it goes in, they're, they're defenseless, and they will um, always doubt the, their own inner voice. From psychological point of view of child development, that child's personal development stops at the point of that shaming. So they will always be emotionally immature because their development is totally arrested by that behavior. And the adult population um, believes that this kind of behavior is normal. Well, it's very common, but it doesn't make it okay. And they um, deny that it has such a negative effect um, so that the beliefs that the conventional morality has conveyed to the adult population, which is carried generation after generation after generation, are very hard to shift. And very often those adults who have those beliefs were shamed in their childhood for various reasons. And then they believe that it is good to be shamed because the um, adult moral authorities are good people Therefore, they themselves are bad people, so the only way to become good is to become like the people who do bad things, but who are classified as good. And it becomes very intricate, very twisted, and very, very difficult to change. Mm. So the actual steps for coming out of it, um, a person, to, to help a person out of it has to be an extremely skilled and well-trained uh, psychiatrist or psychologist, and they have to put in a huge amount of effort. They also have to um, do that therapeutic work with the entire family, mm. because if it's only the individual, it doesn't work. Mm. So then the whole family has to reassess their fundamental beliefs 
and then that family becomes isolated from the rest of society, which means you then have to take your therapeutic work to a much wider um, entire society level, which means it's really educating society and that means there has to be a paradigm shift. And to educate society, I think we could make a comparison that in South Africa, where you come from, for many, many decades, the system of apartheid was in place. And it, I don't know how long it was there. Do you know? 40 years? So 40 years can be like two generations. And uh, in Russia, for example, communism was 70 years, which was about three generations. So you have these entire generations who are taught, trained through the state, through the education system, through the media, etc., that such and such an attitude is correct and moral. And then anybody who objects to it, they're terrorists, they're uh, antisocial, they're bad, and they deserve to be incarcerated, tortured, whipped, killed, uh, shamed, blamed, etc. And then the struggle to restore uh, something which is much more spiritually based um, happens at great cost. There is a huge amount of trauma which endures for many years. Because even if you look at the system of apartheid in South Africa, though it is no longer legally enforced, but it's socially enforced, you see. So that um, um, propaganda of apartheid is still there. And there are so many people who will maintain the attitudes, you see. And they will do behaviors which reflect that attitude, which are hurtful, harmful. Uh, and so there is an economic apartheid, even though there isn't a legal apartheid. So it's just as effective, you see. So in order for people to really learn to see themselves as um, human beings, uh, who are all, you know, equal in the eyes of God, and the difference between them is to do with their character, to do with, you know, many, many attributes, but none of which is a reason to um, put a person down or to shame a person or whatever. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes, I do. So, Denise, um, I once had it said that if somebody is, um, experiences a trauma, is traumatized, that uh, trauma becomes part of their identity. Oh, yes. And um, can one come back from that if it happened when one was a child? Can one come back from that if it happened as an adult and it's a very deep-seated trauma? Because to, mm -hmm. I'm thinking in the context of this topic where you, you somehow feel, um, you know, we play the... the um, songs in the mind, if only that day I didn't take that route to work, you know, where you, the victim blames herself, himself for what happened, and you carry with yourself that feeling of shame. How does one get out of that pattern? Um, that's the first question. The second one is you mentioned that one needs to see a good psychologist or psychiatrist to get to the bottom of things. There are many people who are watching this show that do not have the finances or even the resources that you just mentioned. So my second question to you is um, uh, if one is has only this program as a resource, okay, how does one um, do self-work? to recover from this uh, all-pervading sense of shame. Uh, um, and I'm referring to the type of shame where you feel horrible to even be in your own skin. You, you, want to, you want to jump out of your own skin. I feel that the trauma is not a single event, but it's a whole series of setups that enable that single event to occur so that the trauma is not just the event, but all of the things that lead up to it. So the trauma begins with social attitudes, which permit 
the event to take place. You see, I don't feel that the traumatic event is in isolation. And I also think that it's not going to be just one event. It's going to be a series of events in which there may be one particularly dramatic event that is the identified trauma. But I really don't think it's just like that. There's a whole set of things to do with it. Now, the uh, community of the therapeutic community doesn't have the adequate education or the time, certainly not the financial reward, to um, enable society as a whole to actually work through this through the system of um, widespread therapy. So I feel that it has to be done through education. And what that means is whatever kind of education you use, say if we look at this television program, is just a single little candle in a big black dark night. It's a very powerful image. But at the same time, uh, anybody who wants to be an instrument for change is um, essentially starts like that, a single little candle in a big black dark night. And then, you know, you have to persist. And I again refer to the um, a statement of Schopenhauer that when you want to bring in change, the first thing that will happen to you is you'll be ridiculed. The second thing that happens if you get through that is you'll be strongly opposed, maybe even violently opposed. And then if you can get through that, the third stage, which comes way down the line, is whatever you say becomes mainstream, mm. which means that the uh, power of persistence and um, the bravery required to stand up to all the opposition is really a key factor. Mm. As you speak, um, Malala's face comes to mind, the uh, world's youngest Nobel laureate. Yeah, she epitomizes that um, for me, what you just said. She does, but she's an extremely unusual girl and she had very substantial support from her father, who risked a great deal. I think if she hadn't had that support from her father, it would not have been possible for her to get as far as she has got. Mm. So, I mean, um, acting totally alone is really difficult. But as soon as you start to have a few people who really do give their support, then you can generate enough power to actually withstand the general opposition that you will get. Mm. And this is why I think it's very important uh, to come away from being isolated. Isolated, socially isolated or any other type of isolation? Well, what? socially isolated. One of the problems for women, for example, in many cultures is they're kept within the four walls. Uh, and there are some cultures where the women can move through the town across the rooftops, um, but not in the streets. Because if you're in the street, then you're automatically a bad person. You have to be escorted by a relative, a male relative. And um, so because of these ideas that are fixed in the culture, any woman who is not with bodyguards must be a bad person, you see. And that attitude is um, um, propounded by the leading moral authorities, with usually religious authorities. And they are the ones who teach the society the attitudes they should have. And then the issue comes that what I would call spiritually correct comes in pretty strong opposition with what is religiously correct. And then you have to really see how is it possible that something spiritually correct would be so opposed by the um, conventional religions or the conventional um, legal system, you see. So, so here we are touching very... Um, sensitive uh, areas, you see, because a person who uh, is a religious authority 
He says, well, I am backed up by God, you see. Um, but then um, who decides what God is, you see, because God is so subtle. Um, if you are strong enough and um, you're supported by enough conventions, rituals, scriptures, traditions, um, you make people afraid to go against you. And so then the purity that is represented by God is um, becomes, in a sense, irrelevant. And so here is where we touch on very sensitive area. Hmm. Um, I like the term that you mentioned, spiritually correct. It's, hmm. um, it's a fresh terminology. Sister Denise, you know, I once um, read something by Khalil Gibran, which stated that before one conquers the one that one fears, one is to conquer fear in one's own heart. Uh, is shame, uh, does shame work in a similar principle? Well, the thing with shame, which is um, so devastating, is that it's almost like um, a chip is implanted into that soul. Like, you know, they put viruses in computers. It's like that. And it completely wrecks the capacity of the soul to develop properly. Uh, so fear, um, it, you can deal with fear, but shame is much deeper and much, much more difficult to deal with because it's artificially implanted negativity. Mm. And yet there's something within the human spirit that fights against it if it's uh, false. Is it there not? Um, I think that uh, it can be so damaging that a person doesn't even realize that it's been put into me from outside. They think it's me, you see. So the first thing you have to do, uh, which is why the therapeutic community is relevant in this, is you have to look at the original moment where that shame was introduced, you see. And the difficulty for a child uh, who is shamed by their mother or their father is it's very difficult for a child to say my mother has abused me because it's better to be abused than to be alone. If you say my mother, my father abused me, it means you're totally alone. And you remember you told me a story about a baby who was abandoned in a field? Well, that's what shame does. It says you have no value as a human being and because of that reason you are abandoned, rejected and uh, uh, classified as no good. Um, uh, call me naive but I feel that a human being can come back from anything. Uh, I think so, theoretically. Do, <laughs> uh, if one has enough determination can one come back from such deep-seated shame? I don't think it's a matter of determination. What is it a matter of then? I think it's a matter of feedback from healthy people in the community. But if you don't have that, Denise, if you don't have that, what, what, what do you do then? Because somebody who becomes spiritually aware is often by themselves. Well, if you're spiritually aware and by yourself, that's different from being shamed and by yourself. Okay, you, okay. the emphasis on somebody, somebody's by themselves and is meant to feel shame for something that something happened to them or uh, a trauma inflicted. My question is, can you come back from it? It depends how young. Okay. I mean, somebody who's sexually abused as a baby, and there are many instances of this, that is pre-verbal. Mm. You can't even articulate it to yourself. And usually the being in that baby's body will check out. So there is no conscious capacity to be aware of what has happened. It goes straight to the subconscious and drives the person for the rest of their life, you see. And so to get at that, 
involves very uh, subtle work, which generally conventional society prevents. Mm. They don't want anybody to go there, because mm. if anybody goes there, you know, they might have to face their own negativity, and they don't want to do that. Okay. Because the adult population as a whole is implicated. Mm. And as soon as you start to suspect that you're somehow implicated in a human suffering that is outside of your control or beyond you, that is such a horrible feeling inside that you'll do anything to prevent that ever coming to the surface. Mm. This is the difficulty. Now, when we start talking about this, it's very good because then it starts being articulated, it starts going into the air, uh, you know, people will have flashbacks, they'll have dreams, they'll have, um, um, they'll put two and two together and all of a sudden something will become clear to them. And then if that happens to a person, which it does, you know, then they've got some anchors to hold on to, to say, you know what, this happened. And everybody around them will say, no, I was with you at that time, nothing ever happened. They're lying, you see. So you have to be so sharp to be able to get through this net of lies and denials and so on and so forth that it takes a very extraordinary person to come out of it. It can be done, but it is an extraordinary thing to do it. But the more you get more extraordinary things of this nature, then it becomes ordinary then it becomes possible for others. You know, it's like the first person with a machete who cuts through a path in the jungle. Well, it's easier for everybody else to follow them. But when you're the first one, that takes so much courage, so much inventiveness, so much um, thinking out of the box. And there are people who do that, and they then open up the way for others. And I do think that this is happening a great deal and this is why the shifts, the paradigm shifts, uh, are happening. Hmm. Okay, unfortunately, that is the end of today's show. Um, I hope that you were able to hear Sister Denise's message that if you're in a position where you are experiencing shame, um, and shame is different from guilt, it's different from fear, it is a ugly feeling and experience all by itself. If you are experiencing shame, whether you have named it or not, Sister Denise has shared some um, gems of wisdom, like the fact that shame could be in your subconscious and not necessarily in your conscious mind. So what she was sharing is that you, one is able to come back from this feeling into a feeling or sensation of not feeling shame, but it requires introspection, it requires work. And if you're fortunate enough, also uh, take the support from um, people around you. Um, and her message is quite clear. It is possible to come back from it using spiritual values. Okay, Sister Denise, thank you so much for your um, words of wisdom. And we hope to see you again soon. Thank you and goodbye.